Welcome to the Ark. We've been in a series called Christmas Essentials. If you brought your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open up to Luke chapter 1. You can put a bookmark in there. Over the last several weeks, we've been learning what is essential to the Christmas story. Uh, if you're a guest with us, you can go online and, and see some of the past messages and get caught up. If you're with us online, if this is your first time, uh, first message that you've seen, you can go back and see some of the messages that began this series. But what is essential for Christmas, what we have learned and what we have understood over the last several weeks, the essential part of Christmas is Jesus. That the other stuff is exciting and, and, and plays a role in all those things, but the most essential element of Christmas is Christ. Today we look at the miracles that exude in the Christmas story, that as Christians we find ourselves in a miraculous beginning and in a miraculous ending, and we in Advent are right in between of his miraculous return. Because we are waiting for Christ's return, and when Christ returns, it will be a miracle. It will be a miracle to the world, but it will be something expected by the church. We expect it to happen. Amen? Amen. We expect it. So, as we're working out those technical things here, in Luke chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 26. In the English Standard Version, it says this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house or lineage of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the, Lord, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. We find ourselves in the middle of this story because we're in the middle of the Christmas season. And, we're, and we get wrapped up and we got the lights and we've got the presents and we've got shopping lists and we've got all these things. And then we're reminded that Christmas isn't really about those things, are they? It's not really about materialism. It's not really about the gifts and, and what you get and what you give and all those things. And, and we have this story of an ordinary, marginalized, unimportant person being chosen to be the vessel of grace and love for, the, for all of humanity. We get caught up. Now, we haven't gone there yet, but we get caught up in things like the Mission Inn in Riverside. We want to go see the lights. I want to go see the lights. I want to see the lights, I want to hear the sound, I want to eat a big old bucket of mom's, grandma's donuts or whatever they are. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's the season, right? That's the season. We want to be a part of that. There's nothing wrong with participating in the season. There's nothing wrong with it. But if we center ourselves around that, we probably will come up pretty empty. So when we look at what is essential for Christmas, and who, perhaps, more importantly, is essential for Christmas. And we've looked at 
what it means to have Jesus' lineage and his bloodline and what, why that was significant. We looked at that last week, and why, why that was important and how that fulfilled prophecy and how the scriptures reveal to us the story of Jesus' family, how there's some skeletons in the closet in Jesus' history. I know you guys don't have any skeletons, not you guys. But in Jesus' own family, there were some skeletons in the closet. We learned about that last week. And there's a, there's a couple points we want to look at in this, in this passage that we, that we looked at in Luke chapter 1. The very first thing for us is that as we look at our statement here, God's miracles reveal his power, his holiness, and his love for humanity, especially in the virgin birth of Jesus. But they, miracles in and of themselves, are not to be worshipped as God. We don't seek after miracles for the sake of supernatural awe. They are an essential part of the story, but they are not what we seek. I want you to uh, turn with me in, in Luke, and maybe we can go back there. It's, it would be the fifth slide there. Luke 1, I want to read verse 35 again. When the angel answered Mary, and Mary's asking, how am I going to have a baby? I've never been with a man before. You know, so even back then, they understood some biology. They understood biology. They understood basic human anatomy. And she said, this is an impossibility because I haven't been with a man. So how's that going to work? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. There's a word right there. Let me give you a word of advice. Anytime you see this word in Scripture, anytime you see the word, therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. Okay? So, therefore, what what is therefore? Because the Holy Spirit will come upon Mary and the power of the Most High will overshadow Mary. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy. Friends, without the virgin birth, Jesus is just another dude. He's just another guy. But with the virgin birth, supernatural things begin to happen. In the virgin birth of Jesus, miraculous things begin to take place. Now, there are some amongst my own peers and Pastor Kevin's peers, and and maybe you even know, people who consider themselves Christians but deny that miracles exist. The issue that we have with that is that then they have to deny, I'll go ahead and make up a statistic, 90% of Scripture. I don't know how much it's in there, truly. But there's a lot of miraculous events in Scripture. Jesus being one of them. His conception being one of them. If you don't believe in miracles, then you don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. If you don't believe in miracles, then you don't have a virgin birth. And if you don't have a virgin birth, then Jesus is just like you and me, meaning that he has a sinful nature. But Jesus not being born of a man means that he was not born with a sinful nature. He was not appealed to sin. He did not desire sin. It was not something that that he longed for. Like you and I have so battled and been confused and been defeated by sin again and again and again. If Jesus is just another person, then when it comes to the crucifixion, thousands of people were crucified by the Romans. What makes Jesus special? Because he is the most high son of God. Because he's not just like me and he's not just like you. There's a part of him that is. He has organic human DNA and flesh that comes from Mary. But there's a part of him that is supernatural. That continues to be supernatural. That that although this is the time when Jesus was born, we call the theological word incarnation. God becoming flesh. God exhibiting flesh. Although this is the time that he was born, this is not the time that he was created. He is uncreated. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1. So we have to have this understanding that that Jesus holds this duality. And if we reduce Jesus only to a person, and we deny the virgin birth, we essentially deny the divinity of Christ. And if you deny the divinity of Christ, what was the point of the cross? 
And if you deny the power of the cross, then there is no hope for the church. I mean, truthfully. Once we start to... You ever play that game Jenga? You ever know that game Jenga? Once you start to take out little pieces here and there, it starts to get a little shaky. It doesn't stand as strong. And you start to take out... Ah, we, you know, the Jesus... Ah, we'll just take that part out, the virgin birth. Ah, it's not really a big deal. The, the crucifixion, uh, you know, maybe he was, uh, we'll just take that part out. And things start to topple real easy in our faith when we begin to compromise with the world. The church, friends, we're not called to compromise with the world and change the message so that it's more palatable to people. Paul says that people in darkness are offended by the light. So we shouldn't be shocked when they stand opposed to the message of the gospel. We don't stop either when they stand opposed. We don't, we don't tuck our tails and run and hide when people stand opposed. The church's call is not to be politically correct, but to be biblically correct. That is our call. That is who we are meant to be and supposed to be. But you start taking little pieces out here and there, and, and, and you, you know, have issues, well, scientifically, that's impossible. Of course it is. We know it's scientifically impossible. But in verse 37, I have it underlined in my Bible, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Now, here's, here's what we do. We take that first little bit, for nothing will be impossible. All right, I like it. Nothing will be impossible. I can do whatever I want. The key element, the key phrase Right there, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. What that means is that you and I are limited. There are, there are limitations to what we can do, to what we can achieve, to what we can accomplish. There are limitations. But with God, and in God's plan, and in His timing, and in His way, he makes the impossible possible, the improbable probable. So when we come and we say, nothing will be impossible, we have to be sure that we don't leave that with God part out. Because otherwise, we're just being arrogant, thinking that we can do whatever we want to do. Have you ever met an arrogant Christian before? They'll take part of a scripture, faith the size of a mustard seed, and they say, I can move mountains. Friend, no, you cannot. The Holy Spirit can move mountains, absolutely. And he will use you as a tool to do it. That's, that's our call. We're not called to be the Holy Spirit, but to allow the Holy Spirit to inhabit us, to live within us. That we don't try to do God's work for him, but that we are instruments for his noble purpose. That's the call. That's who we are meant to be. But so often... In the Christmas story, miracles become something that we seek. We try to put God on trial. Prove it, God. If you are who you say you are, prove it. Here's the thing. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to prove anything to me. I'm the one that has a birthday and a death day. Not him. Not him. We celebrate Christmas as Jesus' arrival for the first time. We call it his birthday. Eh, theologically, maybe not really so much because he is uncreated. You read Colossians and it shows us that God, Jesus, is uncreated. He existed in the beginning with God, is God, and remains God. We experience and encounter God through Jesus Christ. That he is our exegesis or study of God that we study God and we get to know who God is based on Jesus, that he has revealed himself in this way. What is miraculous about this is that he has chosen to love us. He has chosen to be with us and engage with us and do life with us. For 30 some odd years, Jesus walked the earth in a time where there was disease and oppression. He, he, walked the earth and lived in a country that was occupied by another country. 
That's hard for you and I to get as Americans. We don't know what that's like. We, we, we don't know what that's like. We don't want to know what that's like. In the hint of anyone occupying us, we rise up and ready to fight. We are, we are locked, cocked, and ready to go. Because as Americans, we die with our boots on. That's the spirit of America. You don't let anybody occupy you. But Jesus chose to, occupy, to enter into a time and a land that was occupied by hostile people. Where he did not have freedom like you and I experience freedom. That any time he could be beaten and, and, and eventually cost him his life. So it's interesting to us how we play it safe and we want God to do certain things for our situations. But the truth is that God is not a situational savior. Jesus is not a situational savior. He's not trying to redeem just certain situations in your life. But the whole thing, the whole life, every area, the things that you think are hidden, the attitudes that we display toward one another when we get in a bad mood or things don't go our way. How many times do you hear someone, they're searching for God, they say they're seeking for God, but the truth is, they're not seeking God. They're seeking what God can do for them. There's a difference, church. There's a difference between seeking God and just seeking what God can do for you. When I was a kid, I went to this church in San Jacinto, Church of the Nazarene. And uh, I had a friend there who was part of the youth group. And he and I were pretty close, pretty close friends. He was way more handsome than I was, so he got all the ladies. He got all the girls. He went to high school, and oh man, he was a football star. And everybody loved this guy, and everybody wanted to hang out with him. He became the life of the party. And he became the party animal. Well, party animals kind of have a hard time graduating high school when they've actually graduated. So he got in trouble after high school, continuing to be the party animal. And he got caught with a bunch of drugs and doing a bunch of stuff that he shouldn't have been doing. And he uh, was facing jail time. And then my friend reached out to the church and said, church pastors, would you write a character letter for me about, you know, just, just letting them know about how wonderful of a person I am and the judge wants to know if I'm a good guy or a bad guy and all these things. And I wasn't involved in the situation at the time. So uh, the pastor and their youth, youth pastor at the time wrote a character letter for this guy. And he came to church for a couple weeks and he ended up not having to face any jail time and he got probation. And the church never saw him again. And I see him every once in a while or exchange text messages with him every once in a while. No thought of God, no thought of spirituality, no thought of the church, just living his life because he wasn't seeking God. He was seeking what God could do for him. He wasn't seeking intimacy with the church. He was seeking what the church could do for him. There's a significant difference, a significant difference between when we finally reach the end of our rope and we feel broken and we feel worn out and tired and we're ready to throw up our hands and say, Okay, God, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll do it your way, not my way. See, there's, there's a part of Christianity that maybe we, we, we struggle with a little bit, and it's, it's the submission part, the submitting to the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. Conviction is what we call it. That when we feel this conviction in our hearts, we respond. My New Year's resolution for 2016 was to trust my gut, was to go with my gut. In some ways, I did that. I ended up here. I don't know how I ended up here. I ended up here. In other ways, not so much. In other ways, I was still like, I would, I would get an inkling and think, oh, maybe I should do, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. Uh, maybe I should share it with this person. No, oh, they're a stranger. I don't want to talk to strangers today. So I, certain times I trust my gut and certain times not. My resolution for 2017 is to trust my gut, is to listen to the Holy Spirit when he nudges, when he says, you know what you should be doing in this situation. What will you do? And that means that there's going to be uncomfortable silences. There's going to be uncomfortable words that I have to share. There's going to be times where I just sit with someone who's broken 
There's going to be times where I have to do things that I think, Lord, I don't want to do this. It's Friday or it's Saturday. I don't want to be dealing with this today. But to trust your gut is to trust the Holy Spirit. To say, Lord, will you lead me? That's a, that's a scary prayer. Because there are times, if we're honest, don't raise your hand, I don't want you to blow your cover here, okay? But there are times when we're going through life and we're dragging the Holy Spirit like he's a dog that doesn't know how to walk on a leash. We're dragging God with us like, I'm doing my thing, you just got to come with me. You got to come with me and bless whatever I want because the preacher said you got to bless me. I, I want you to come with me and just, just, you know, we're dragging God with us as if we can manipulate him. As if, as if we can bend God to our will. That's not how it works. We don't bend God to our will. We bend to His. We submit ourselves to God. So when it comes to miracles, if you've ever prayed for a miracle, was it a situational miracle? Lord, redeem this situation? Because then we toe the line there. Are we just looking for a situational Savior? Lord, save me from this situation. I only want you to be Christ in this circumstance. I only, only want you to be Lord when, it's, when it is this way for me. So when we look for miracles, are we looking for miracles that fit our own agenda? Are we looking for the miraculous and the supernatural in a way that we can say, see, I told you so. I knew it. I was right all along. That's not the call. That's not who we're meant to be. We're not called to seek miracles. So when we're seeking miracles, Jesus says in Matthew 12, 39 and Matthew 16, 4, that an evil and adulterous people seek after signs and wonders. I didn't say it. You can look up those scriptures. Jesus said it to the Pharisees. He said an evil and adulterous generation, an adulterous people. Why is it adulterous? Whoa, whoa, you, whoa, calm down. I just asked you to do something, something cool so that I could put it on Facebook. Well, why am I adulterous? Because you don't love me. You love what I can do. See, there's a difference. There's a difference between loving God and just loving what he can do for you. Just, just hearing all the good, the good preaching and the good things. I always want to hear all the... I want him to make me feel good. See, that's, that's not really Christianity. That's moralistic, therapeutic deism. Moralistic, yeah, tell me what's right and wrong. That's fine. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I won't. Therapeutic, make me feel good. Deism, God, in this, in this abstract kind of way. We don't really know who he is. Yeah, he reveals himself as Jesus. We know who God is. We know the heart of God when we know Jesus. But if we find ourselves seeking after miracles, essentially what we're doing is say, Prove it, God. And he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to prove himself to us. He's God. What we do doesn't affect his day. Now, he chooses to enter in to our lives, and it gets messy. We know that our lives can get messy, right? Maybe not you. Maybe my life only. Only my life. Maybe I'm the only one that has extended family that, you know, this is why I got no hair, friends. Maybe I'm the only one that has to do with difficult relationships. I'm pretty sure you've got some people in your life that challenge you a bit. Yeah? You've got some people in your life that you're like, oh, Lord, help me here. Help me. Give me the patience. No, no, don't pray that. <laughs> don't pray that. If you pray for God to give you patience, oh, he will. He'll bring some people that will try your patience. So I would just encourage you as your pastor and your friend, I don't know, I'm going to pray for that. Be careful, be careful. But when we seek the miracles... When we're seeking the supernatural over the personal, we're losing the heart of Christianity. We're missing out on the heart of who God is. A wicked, adulterous people seek lust after the miraculous. But then number two is that to believe in miracles is an essential element of Christianity. But to demand a miracle is idolatry. So it means that when, and maybe we don't pray this enough, it means that when the diagnosis comes back unfavorable, we gather the saints together and we anoint with oil and we pray, and the closing in that prayer is your will be done. 
But we don't always pray that. We just say, Lord, heal me. End. Lord, heal it. Heal the marriage. Fix the relationship. Fix this. Situational. But if we come to Christ and we say, your will be done, that's the Lord's prayer. That's not the pastor's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth, just as it is done in heaven. How is it done on earth as it is done in heaven? Everyone in heaven has submitted their will to God's will. So when we pray a prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, we're saying, I submit my will to God's will. And if it is God's will for me to get sick and pass away, your will be done. If it is God's will to bless me and to multiply my family and everything is great, your will be done. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I have learned in all things to be content, whether I have a lot or whether I have a little bit, whether I'm, I'm blessed tremendously or whether the world says I'm cursed. That I've, I've learned in all things to be content because God's grace is sufficient for me. God's grace is sufficient. I want to get there. I couldn't tell you that I am there yet. Because there are times I'm like, Lord, I know I don't need this, but I sure do want it. It is the desire of my heart, Lord. And God is, the King James says, long-suffering. He is long-suffering with his people. He is patient with his people. He's patient with us. But the call, the call for us is to be ready to submit our wills to him. Not demanding signs and wonders. Not saying, Lord, if you don't heal this, if you don't fix this, then I don't trust you. Well, friend, you don't trust him. Period. If you're demanding him to do something, you don't trust him. Because you don't manipulate God. You don't force your will and your opinion and your thought on God. It doesn't work. In the same way that God doesn't force you, He woos you, He encourages you, He wants you to be with Him, but He doesn't force you to be with Him. In the same way, we can't force Him to do what we think He should do, to be who we think He should be. Or to change people, to change their personality. They have an awful personality. God, change them. Change their heart. The prayer is, Lord, fix me. Fix my heart. There's something wrong with my vision and the way that I see them. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. May I be like you. The things that God desires are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Not a bunch of head knowledge and a puffed up arrogant attitude. That's not what God wants from us. And when we come to things about the supernatural and we look at the miracles, God chooses when those things take place. Not me. Do I pray for healing? Do I pray for fixed relationships? Do I pray for love and compassion to abound? Absolutely. Absolutely we want those things. Absolutely we pray for those things. But when he moves is up to him. And how God moves is up to him. I don't put God on a leash and think that I can control him. That's idolatry. We think that idolatry is just making a little statue and then praying to the statue. Some of you have heard this teaching before, but truly idolatry, the, the philosophy behind it, was that if you could create an image, a graven image in stone or wood or gold, and you created that image and it looked like that spirit, you got him. You captured that spirit within that, within that idol, and you could bend his will to your will. That's why Jesus is saying, idolatry, you don't get to bend my will, friends. You won't bend my will to what you want to do. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. So when it comes to miracles, we recognize, yeah, they're genuine, they're real. But I'm not the prophet Elijah calling down fire from heaven so that I can prove something to anybody. God doesn't need to prove anything to anybody except show his love. And he does that through me and through you. So 
when we come to this, we're going to go to the next slide here, this, where would you rather be? What, what, what are you more drawn to? The things that are, are miraculous or the things that are everyday? We, we maybe tend to think that God has the miraculous. If we find something miraculous, supernatural, oh man, that's God. If we see something that we can't explain, oh, that's God. That's amazing. That's wonderful. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to go to the next slide. In Luke chapter 2, you see the angels and the shepherds. And the shepherds are out in their field. They're camping out. They're, they're, they're with their sheep. They're doing their jobs. And all of a sudden, the angels show up. And they announce Jesus's. This is the first Facebook post. They announce Jesus's birth. They say, glory to God in the highest heaven. Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. The shepherds are astonished. And all of a sudden, there's a whole host of angelic chorus. And they're singing this beautiful song. Now, down the road a bit, in a little town, there are a couple having a baby. And Jesus is being born in filth. You know the story. Many of you know the story. There was no room at the inn. And so they go into the stable. They go into the barn. Jesus is born in a barn. He never had to close a door in his life. No? You get that? My mom always said that to me. Where were you born in the barn? Close the door! <laughs> Jesus was literally born in a barn. It's a literal thing for him. No one was born poorer. He had nothing. Ordinary. Plain. Unassuming. So here you have Jesus, born into the ordinary, born to a 16-year-old girl. Disgraced, because everyone thought, uh-huh, yeah, Holy Spirit, sure, Joseph. Sure, yeah, that happens all the time, doesn't it? Right. So there was, here's Jesus, born into what the world considered shame and disgrace, in poverty. And then you've got the shepherds over here that are just camping out in the field and the angels appear to them to give them the good news and they run into town. Where would you rather be? Where would you rather be? Would you rather be where the shepherds were at? I want to hear the angels singing. That sounds awesome. That sounds beautiful. I want to hear the angelic chorus and see the bright light. And I want to see the miracle. I want to see the supernatural thing. Or would you rather throw a blanket over Mary and give Jesus his first bath, wash his hair, be with him? Where would you rather be? Because God doesn't always show up in the miraculous. He's not always there. In the Christmas story, Jesus' presence is in the ordinary, not in the miraculous. There are miraculous things taking place. But if we seek that, if that's what we lust for and long after, then our heart's in the wrong spot. Our heart's in the wrong place. If we're not actually seeking the presence of Jesus, I just want to be with the Lord. Then I can see Jesus on your face. You can see Jesus on the face of your children, on the face of one another. You can act on his behalf when you show compassion and love and patience. It's miraculous, I think, when a couple decides to stay together after infidelity. It's miraculous. It's miraculous, I think, when people are willing to forgive one another when they feel like they've been hurt and wounded really bad. It's miraculous, I think, when we in the church are able to influence a world that culture is so off base. It's miraculous. And it still takes place in the ordinary, day-to-day -day events. There are miracles that take place. We don't have to see and witness the angels singing and, and the glory. That, that's going to happen. That's the kingdom of God. That's heaven, if you will. We'll experience that in due time. It's not something that we demand God 
to show himself to us and to do certain things for us. Look at this last scripture. It's Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. They reveal God's glory. Not my glory. Not your glory. They're not for your situations or your circumstances. They're for the glory of God. These miraculous events that take place. They're not supposed to be for our benefit so that God can prove himself. He will work miracles when he chooses to work miracles. He will do as he will do and he will be as he will be. I have to be willing to submit myself and my will and my ideas about how my situation is supposed to go to God. To truly allow the Holy Spirit to move in a way that maybe is uncomfortable. Maybe brings conviction. Maybe means that I was wrong about something. Nah, not me. Nah. Maybe it means that there was something I did that offended somebody. Maybe it means that there was something I said. Maybe there was something that you said or something that you did or a way in which you said it where the Holy Spirit is trying to bring peace and reconciliation and saying, go give them a hug. Go invite them to lunch. Go be with them. Go find out what they like to do for fun. Go be with them. That's the miracle, I think, that we are supposed to seek, is compassionate humanity. Because humanity can be pretty selfish and pretty self-centered. And perhaps the miracle is supposed to be that you and I live differently, walk differently, think differently, interact with each other and with the world differently, all for the glory of God. So as we close this morning, I want you to consider, are you seeking God? Or are you seeking what God can do for you? Are you seeking a Savior for the whole world in your whole life? Or do you just want Him to fix one little situation? Jesus is not a contractor. He's not going to come and only work on one area of your life. He wants to help rebuild the whole thing. And if it means he's got to tear down the old one, then so be it. So be it. If Jesus has to tear down our old life in order to rebuild a new one, will you let him? Will you allow him to be Lord over the whole project of your life? Or do you still want to keep him isolated to just one area? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence, knowing that you are God and that you are good. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would give us a mindset and a reminder that we are called not to seek after the supernatural, but to bear witness when we do and to give you the glory when you reveal yourself in supernatural ways. May we not try and put you to the test, Lord. Search our hearts. Search our minds. If even in our prayers, Lord, we make demands of you, convict us that it would not be so, that we submit to your will, that we submit to your Holy Spirit, that we allow you to be at work in our hearts, in our friendships, in our relationships, that you are restoring all things to yourself, and may we be a part of it. Thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift of salvation. Thank you, Lord, that without miracles, there's no virgin birth. The crucifixion doesn't mean anything, and there's no resurrection. We believe in the miraculous God. We believe that you have power that is greater, and you are able to do far more than anything we can comprehend. For there is nothing impossible with you. May we begin again 
to believe in the impossible because you make the impossible possible. May we not seek to manipulate you to do our bidding, Lord. May we not worry if you are on our side. May we submit ourselves and seek to be with you on your side, in your presence. May we, Lord, recognize the beauty of the angelic choir in the field with the shepherds, but hunger after the intimacy of the birth with Mary and Joseph. May you call us into your presence that we would desire to be with you and intimate with you more than any other gift we could ever receive. In the precious, perfect, and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.